Brooklyn Independent Television. This is so washed out. It's a little washed out. It's a little washed yeah. out, but you know. They don't have much money for maintenance, so there's an argument for seeing even if we could color correct this. We could color correct it, but it's also a truer representation of the colors than than what we would get with the the halogen or the the fluorescent. I'm afraid the halogen might make the yellows a little bit too yellow. All right, so why don't we check that? Let's 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 go for the last one. One of the reasons I think that lighting is so difficult to talk about is it exists at such different levels in our life. One of them is one in which we totally take it for granted. It's literally what we move through. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to describe, like it's very difficult to describe your own digestive process. It's just what you do. For a long time I was really focused on residential lighting design, high-end residential and art the lighting of art, and I had a fairly successful business doing that. In street lighting, what came up for me, I was doing a lot of volunteer work while I was working in residential, and I was working in some fairly heavy neighborhoods. I was in East New York, um, I was in Far Rockaway. I would have this feeling as though I was in a frightening place, but I wasn't necessarily in shadow, and it began to occur to me, what what is it about these city streets that makes them so unpleasant to be in? Lighting isn't just quantity, it's not even just quality, it has a huge symbolic function. What people in East New York, when I was interviewing, wanted was the same nice lights that they have on Park Avenue and Fifth Avenue. We want to know the city cares about us, and we want to not be related to as people who can't protect our own lighting fixtures. We want those nice looking lanterns, and so we actually attach them to the above ground poles. Instead of measuring crime rates, what I measured was how many books were taken in and out of the library before we let it and after. We learned you can amplify light, you know, you, you can make more out of what's there. Very little money, very little sort of impact on energy use, and a tremendous change. When we tend to talk about lighting, it's when it's like snapping its fingers at you. And in fact, people can talk about they can, they can address the sort of poetic qualities of light, mm -hmm. how light makes them feel first thing in the morning, natural light, and, and they can often talk about it mythically. But, you know, if you say, like, do you like incandescent or fluorescent, you know, right. it's a harder discussion. This light bulb is your basic old-fashioned incandescent light. This is a fluorescent version of it. This is a more developed form of that, a sort of later generation fluorescent. But now, what we're talking about, the state of the art at the moment, is what's called, you know, the LED attempt to create... Well, the, the reality is this will never, never do the job of an incandescent, but it might do another job, and we could then add a little bit of incandescent if we need to for accent. For us, the struggle is, is to find the right lighting, the right perfume, the right essence, the right relationship to the materials of a home, and the right emotional qualities. And select on that basis, but again, always being ca careful and conscious of, of energy requirements. Lighting design is the manipulation of light bulbs as well as urban environments. It's our, the kind of art we're interested in is the art that is situated in public space and actually participates in making that public space more accessible, or usable, fun, delightful. The first project I got after I finished doing my PhD was a project with Maya Lin in Grand Rapids, and it was a, an art piece which started small and then morphed into a large skating rink. It's a picture of the sky over Grand Rapids at the Millennium, and it was utterly transformative of the downtown neighborhood. And then this was a project that we were asked by um, Labius Wood and Kiki Smith. So it's like a huge sandwich of light and and sculpture. We were drawing with light and it was one of the most popular of the installations because the Finns really appreciated that you had to get on it to, to experience it. Syracuse University and some of the colleagues who were teaching in the landscape architecture department came to us and said we have this project. We want to connect five miles 
of streets between one end of the university and the other. We want to include the city in this. This is a city university project. But we want to make sure that bikers and walkers and people taking buses feel a connection, a spine running through the city. For our university students, we want them to be clear where does it begin, where does it end. They decided that one of the ways they could do this was to paint a red stripe all the way along, but the other was to create a lighting system. Most people experience light poles as a system, regularly spaced, and they just push it to the edge of their consciousness. We said, no, let's do things. Let's have single light poles. Let's pair them together. Let's put them in threes. Let's make them surprising. Let's make them dance. Here's what we did with a garage, painting the inside of a, where the parking area. Here's a mural that um, Pentagram designed. And here we said, look, if we could just get hold of the big, huge, luminous ad board and print it with something that said Syracuse, we could do more to change the neighborhood. And they did. They got hold of it. So in terms of what our, our office is doing, this is our first real exploration of what does sustainability mean in terms of using less light, but being much more creative about the symbolic va value of the pole what does it mean to people, and how do you sort of bring them through a corridor? These are examples of the solar pavers that we're using in Syracuse, and it's state-of-the-art technology. It has a battery that recharges itself. It doesn't need to be changed. They last for 25 years, and they're, they're, a, they're a way of adding sort of enchantment and interest to a public space without necessarily adding a big source of light. This is one of our most challenging projects. Um, it is Grace Church. It's one of the oldest churches in Brooklyn. It's presented us with a lot of very interesting challenges. And um, one is, is how, do you, how do you relight a church sustainably? How do you keep their electricity bill low and their maintenance at, at the absolute minimum? In public lighting, there is an awareness now that we're using too much energy, mm -hmm. that we want to protect the night sky, and that you know we're beginning to damage other species by putting too much light. So people are wondering now not just about how to add more light. Now the questions we're thinking about are what should we take away? One of the things that we're learning from looking at, at older technologies is that lanterns for, for much of our history were either carried, you know, it might even, might even have been a hollowed out turnip with a little bit of lit wax in it or it might be a, 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 some kind of burning wood, but also the use of very, very low lighting systems to just tell you where, you where you need to step, where you might trip, where you might stumble, and we're beginning to sort of try to bring that technology back in. So it's not five big lampposts, it's one tiny light, very low down, that tells you where to step. You're putting the light where you need it this old idea of a little skill and a little thoughtful placement, you can use less light. Follow us on Twitter at BK Independent TV.